I'll just uh, start by asking uh, John a question. So uh, do you think that uh, in your innovative talk that it's also innovative for you to go into the operating room and do, for instance, a transventricular muscular VST closure with the surgeon? We've done that a number of times, and we've had some very good success with it. And uh, it, it, it shows uh, that, uh, that innovation goes both it goes across uh, subspecialties and the like. Have you had any experience with that, and can you tell us a little bit about it? So, uh, Dr. Mavrubis is talking about hybrid procedures, and so it's very important that he and I work well together because we do things together. Um, the procedure he's talking about is uh, the muscular VSDs or the VSDs in the heart, that, like the little 24-year-old uh, that I fixed. Um, in smaller patients, because of the way we have to loop the wire and do that, we can hold the valves open and they can get into sort of a low output state and get very, very sick. And it can take a long time to do them. And so it is significantly safer, anyone under about five kilos for sure, maybe even eight kilos, um, to do it in the operating room. And the surgeon makes a small incision and then they use a needle to go right through the right ventricular wall, put a purse string around the needle, and then I just use a wire and a catheter to put the device in the hole. When I come out, they just close the purse string and we're done. And anyone that's coming to the OR for other reasons or maybe has a couple of holes that, that could not be fixed by a patch very easily, uh, we do them in the operating room on a regular basis. We probably do more in the operating room than we do in the cath lab. But in a 19 or 23 year old, I think she was 23, um, we would do that you know, in, in the, uh, and she also had a lot of scar tissue. So she was going to be one that we would do in the cath lab. But most of them we do, we do as a hybrid technique. And there's a whole lot more on that innovation and that technology for patients with single ventricle physiology. Um, and there's a whole lot more that we do with surgeons. Are there, are there any other questions? We have a number of questions here. You're taking my job away. Say again? You're taking my job away. No, I'm just I am? <laughs> I'll sit down. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. This is for... Jack. Jack, Dr. hello. Dr. Rychek. Hi, yes. Um, you focused on uh, stress in a uh, pregnant woman, and uh, maybe I misunderstood or I'm not hearing correctly. Um, however, uh, okay, so what I understood was uh, that you, you may in be inadvertently blaming the mother's stress level for CHD, and my question is, how do you explain all of us um, whom our mothers did not have ultrasounds, um, so they were not stressed out? My mother was probably the happiest she's ever been in her life when she was pregnant with me. So, and yeah. she had one ultrasound. Let me, let me, let me, so uh, one word that, that you mentioned there, which um, I often use in my regular counseling with, with mothers, and is the word blame. and there is no blame uh, in this. There is nobody to blame uh, per se. And, and you know, the, when I sit and discuss the, the identification, the detection of these various anomalies, you know, it, it's a very common emotional response from families to say, "Oh, gee, is this something I did? Is this something I didn't do? Is it a, you know, a glass of wine I had, you know, the night before <laughs> we conceived, or something like that?" There is no data to support any of that in any way. And so this is a, a blameless part of nature, if you will. So let me correct you in terms of, uh, uh, of what I think you were getting at with your question. No, I do not think that, um, that the presence of congenital heart disease is to be blamed on maternal stress. What I'm saying is that um, when you are in the womb, for the nine months that we all have spent time in the womb, there are many factors that contribute to how we are as adults. Um, there uh, is a very famous professor, passed away about three, four years ago, whose name was uh, Barker uh, from England. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the, the notion of the Barker hypothesis, which fascinatingly states that your course for health, in particular, your cardiovascular health, is programmed based on what happens to you during fetal life. How did he come to this conclusion? Um, lots of review of big data from uh, County Kent uh, in the United Kingdom, looking at medical records and found that there was a very, very close relationship between your birth weight 
and your risk for diabetes, obesity, and coronary artery disease and atherosclerotic disease as an adult. Something about the fact that if you're starved during fetal life, and if you're born small, not starved to that severe degree, but, but somewhat, somewhat deprived of optimal nutrition and such, the body programs itself to compensate, and therefore those are the patients who are at greater risk. The smaller your birth weight, the greater the risk for some of these later complications. So that notion has opened a whole area of science looking at fetal programming and the influence of fetal activities on your outcome. So maternal stress, I have no data that suggests no uh, implication, I hope, for my talk that maternal stress causes congenital heart disease. But I think that during pregnancy, there are a number of additional modifiers that can contribute to how well the baby is at birth with the congenital heart disease what the influence might be on neurocognitive outcome uh, of those patients with congenital heart disease. So very concretely and literally, I think, as my bias, we're working towards this and I, we're collecting data that supports it, I think that when we make our diagnosis at 22 weeks of a mom carrying a fetus with transposition of the great arteries, and that's a very stressful situation, realizing your, your perfect baby has a birth defect of the heart and needs surgery and such, um, is that we would someday soon begin to assess the level of stress that mother has, both through psychometric testing and cortisol testing, and apply strategies. Maybe even write a prescription for weekly yoga or, uh, or some other therapeutic aspect that we know is going to potentially reduce maternal stress. That's a long answer to your, to your question, I'm sorry, but I hope I, I addressed that. That was a wonderful response, thank you. Next question. Hi. Um, three years ago, I had a fetal intervention, and at the time, um, there was only five hospitals doing it, and I had to go from Chicago to Texas Children's Hospital, and we were the sixth heart procedure. So are you seeing more and more hospitals doing this now? Yes. There is a, currently a consortium around the world. There are probably close to 40 institutions around the world uh, that are doing fetal cardiac interventions. Um, uh, as with many innovations, particularly uh, surgical or even catheter-based, um, if you don't have a lot of experience and do it regularly, you don't do it well. And so uh, there's no question that centers like Boston, uh, children's, uh, who have to a degree pioneered these techniques, have done the most, uh, and they have a number of uh, different permutations of how things have turned out and have a sense of the subtleties of the procedure that results in a very effective approach. Um, we've done a, a few dozen other centers, uh, University of California, San Francisco, Texas Children's, major congenital heart centers around, around the country have been doing this. Um, the important thing to appreciate is it's still even at a place like a CHOP or a Boston or a Texas Children's, it's a small number relative to the overall number of patients that we see that we manage with congenital heart disease. Just like fetal surgery, it's there for the very, very select um, and the experience is growing, but it's, it's very directed, very focused, and very targeted. We have time for two more questions. Hi there. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you guys for coming out and spending the time talking to us today. It was really interesting and informative, and I know you took your own time to be here, so thank you. Um, my question is about um, transcatheter valve placements. So my son is a candidate for a valve um, replacement in the cath lab. We're super excited about that. Um, but I've heard conflicting things. So one cardiologist said, we don't think he'll ever need another open heart surgery again because we can do this in the cath lab. And then now our current cardiologist said, oh, well, I wouldn't go that far <laughs> because she said, we'll have to keep replacing the valves and you keep putting them in. And so, so I guess, what, which one is more accurate, or are you going to just tell me it's different for everybody? <laughs> so uh, that's a great question, and um, it's a very common scenario that for me in my clinic uh, to hear exactly what you just said. Um, and I'm very careful to never say that you are never going to have another operation. 
because we don't know. We just don't know. You could have endocarditis, an infection, and it just has to be removed. You know, we, there's no way to predict it. We do know that you're going to need close follow-up whenever you have this kind of a repair and this kind of congenital heart problem. And we do know the valve technology has changed tremendously in 10 to 12 years and will again change tremendously in the next 10 to 12 years. Um, it's still developing. So we're hopeful that we'll get to the point where maybe we can be more definitive about whether you can or can't have uh, you know, another operation or will need one. But right now we're very careful not to ever say that. We do try to plan it, right? We know that the valves go in best at about between, well, the Melody valve will go down to about 12 or 14. Boston Children's is even going down to 10, um, but that's through a, a hybrid technique. It'll definitely go down to 14, but 14 is never gonna be big enough. The way I tell parents to think about it is, your average adult pulmonary valve is about 22 millimeters, all right? Or maybe 20, 20 to 24, right? And your pulmonary arteries are like a Y branch. They need to be 12 each, right? Maybe bigger, but in general, you know that the outflow is gonna to need to be around 20 to 24. And so if the valve that's in there is an 18, there's a good chance that eventually it would have to be changed out. If the valve in there's a 26, we might be able to put transcatheter valves in for the next 50 years, we don't know. Um, it takes about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half every time we put one in. So I hope that answers your question. Next question. Hi, um, I think this might be for Dr. Rhodes. Um, how close are we to getting um, using the cardio MEMS for kids? I'm just, I have a 12 year old and he's a pacemaker patient and all of this sounds really cool, but how close are we? So uh, the cardio MEMS, the question is about the cardio MEMS. The cardio MEMS was the little device I showed you that had kind of two little loops on it and it goes in the pulmonary arteries to treat, uh, uh, essentially to measure pressure in the lungs. Right? And, and the, the key is that you don't have to go back and have another cath. Uh, the pressure can be measured by laying on a pad. And um, we, are, we have it for adults. We do not have it for children. And if we wanted to use it now, we could use it now for children, but it would be off-label use, not an FDA indication. And therefore, there'll be insurance-related issues going along with that. And it's not an inexpensive product. It's in the range of 20 plus a uh, thousand for that product, maybe more. It's very expensive. So to get that through the insurance is not gonna be easy. Um, and until the technology probably develops and the price comes down a little bit more, there's some competition. I think it's, it's probably many years away, maybe 10 years away before it would be an FDA approved indication. But we could use it now, especially in an adult age group and someone off label if we can get it through the insurance company. I think you may have also been asking about a pacemaker, right? So that kind of, my ears perked up because uh, one of my wife's uncles just got a pacemaker implanted. It was a deployed pacemaker through a catheter technique, tiny little pellet of a device yeah. that has the lead and the generator in it. Yeah. And it's embedded into the heart and he was deemed to be too high risk candidate for uh, a generator placement and lead placement. So this technology of deployable devices through catheter techniques is just exploding. And yes, that, the technology currently exists to deploy a pacemaker today. 